Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, if you don't know, I'll, I'll tell you the bills are 2-0 and o right now. Uh, <laughs> whatever prayers you've been praying, keep doing that. Yeah, that's, that's good. We're in a series on the Holy Spirit, which is part of an overall theme for this year. The theme is... Uh, we believe that God wants us to thrive in life. So what does that look like and how does that happen? And we started the year by looking at God's wisdom in the book of Proverbs because we think when we have access to God's wisdom, we thrive. And then we talked about uh, being emotionally and spiritually healthy. Sometimes we separate those things and we think that we can be spiritually healthy without being emotionally healthy. And scripture shows us how we can be both. And then we talked about freedom because if we really wanna thrive, we need to be free. And then uh, we're looking at uh, the Holy Spirit because if we're going to thrive in life, it can't just be on our own dynamic, our own personality, our own power. We need to partner with the Holy Spirit. And so we're in Acts, the first chapter, and it says on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with his disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Uh, if you have a, a cell phone or a smartphone, uh, you probably have had moments when it was getting dangerously low on power, even failed. And I wish I could tell you that the only power we were looking for is to keep our smart devices charged, but our world is kind of driven to search for power in its many forms. There's technological power, there's influence power, there's political power, there's military power, there's financial power, all different kinds of power. I, I'm curious, you can just think about this, but if you achieved the kind of power you were searching, searching for, what would you do with it? And I think there's a tendency, a, a secret belief that we all have, that if, if we had the power that other people had, we would do a better job than they are doing. Now, before you cheer or raise your hand, that actually reveals a little bit of pride in us. If I was in control, the world would be better. <laughs> Why is that? The world would be better for you, not the same thing. And so if we're going to look for power in life, how can we know that we can manage and, and, and steward that power in a way that's not just benefiting us, but actually benefits others? And so um, Jesus tells his disciples that they need to wait and they're going to receive a promise and the promise is the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, they are going to be empowered. They're going to have access to amazing power. And their first response, their first response is, will this be the time that we can finally overthrow Rome and Israel will be restored in its political power in our region? Is that when it's going to happen? The early disciples had a deep-seated feeling that the way God showed up in our world is through political systems. Aren't you glad that we've gotten completely rid of that idea now, that we're... <laughs> Nothing like that is ever thought of anymore. Uh, what we think sometimes is that the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our world is less about power and more about comfort. He just makes me feel better about or tolerate things the way they are. And Jesus doesn't think that way at all. And he doesn't want us to think that way either. He wants to, to give us power for living out the mission of Jesus. And the good news is that the mission of Jesus is not either hindered or enhanced by whoever wins the next election. How many know that God is not up in heaven chewing his fingernails right now, wondering the outcome of the election in the United States of America or any other country? Now, we might feel powerless in a lot of situations. So what does it mean for the Holy Spirit 
to empower his people to be witnesses. This is witnesses for Jesus. What does that word mean? It means that you have a firsthand account of something, you've seen or experienced something, and you're willing to share it with someone else. So there are lots of people who have witnessed something, it means that they have seen it, they have observed it, but they don't come forward. And so in a court situation or a police investigation, that's not very helpful. So witness is not just about, I have a personal experience with God, but I'm willing to share that experience with someone else. And he's telling his disciples that they're going to be witnesses. And you have to know that the disciples were, um, they were a mixed bag when it comes to being helpful servants or sharers of good news. In the Garden of Gethsemane, all of them ran away. Peter denied he ever knew Jesus when Jesus was on trial. The disciples used to get in arguments as to over who is going to have more resources or more status. If they are going to be the missionaries to the world, they're going to need a source of power they don't yet have. And so they need to be able to be a witness for Jesus. So what does it mean that the Holy Spirit empowers people to be witnesses? Well, what it means is that you are able to share something normally, casually, joyfully, truthfully. And you know what? You're act you actually do this all the time. So, oh no, Pastor, that's, that's not my personality. I know some people like that. I've seen them on buses and, and on street corners, and they've got their signs, and they've got a megaphone, and they're making a noise. I don't know if it's joyful, but they're making a noise. Okay. Um, we do this all the time. We'll eat a meal at a restaurant that we're trying, and it was outstanding, and what do we do? We tell other people, I was at this restaurant first-hand experience. <laughs> it was outstanding. The food was great. The service was great. Maybe you would like to try it for yourself. I was listening to this uh, band, and they were phenomenal. I didn't think those kinds of bands existed in the world anymore. I think you would enjoy listening to them. Or I was reading this book. This book is so amazing. I, I was captivated by it. I'm not much of a reader, but I couldn't put it down. You, I think you would. I was watching this series on, on TV or on a streaming service, and I really enjoyed it. I think you would enjoy Oh, I just saw this movie, and it was such a good movie. I, I think you would enjoy it, too. We, we witness to others about something we have personally experienced all the time. So why is it different when it comes to our faith? And I don't say that in a condemning way as though, oh, we're getting something wrong. I think the first reason is because the mission of Jesus is not about entertainment. It's about the transformation of the human world or the human heart and our world. And so he calls us to be willing to share. So, so the Holy Spirit has not, by the way, the Holy Spirit has not come to prove we are right. He's come to prove that God is real. We've got enough people trying to prove that they are right, and those conversations, if they aren't boring to you by now, they will become boring to you. But how many think our world could really benefit from discovering that God is real, realer than anything they ever could have imagined in their whole life? Yeah. So what power does the Holy Spirit give us? Well, he gives us the power to share. Uh, 10 days after this conversation, about 120 disciples were in a house in Jerusalem and they were gathered there and they were praying. And in case you're interested, they're in the same, they were in the same posture you're in right now. The Bible says that they were sitting and, and some things began to happen. One is the room that they were in began to have this sound, this incredible sound of a violent wind, this auditory experience. It just, it filled the whole house. And, and that's disturbing a little bit. You know, you would wonder what was happening. And then something else happened. These flames of fire came and it looked like flames of fire and it sat on, on everyone's head. Now, how many here, if you saw flames of fire on other people's heads, that, that would be a little bit traumatic for you. I've got a story. I've got many stories. And I don't have time to tell them all, but I'll tell you one. In, in our church in Jamestown, we, we had a 
uh, candelabras that were fastened to the end of the pew and we were doing a Christmas program, a candlelight Christmas program. It was so beautiful. And, and, and all the candles and, and people singing, it was absolutely wonderful. For, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe somebody hit it or whatever, the, the candelabra went down with all the candles, live candles, not those electronic things, live candles, it went down and it caught a woman's hair on fire. Well, I know, she had a lot of hairspray on and it turns out that's flammable. Now tell me if you saw that, you would go, eh. you know. <laughs> And that was the last time we ever had live candles in that church. <laughs> Little flames set on top of everybody. And then they began to say wonderful things about God in words that they had not learned, in languages that they had not been taught. What's interesting is that they were not preaching a message. They were not teaching theology. They were not debating anyone. They were simply declaring the good things of God. And people came from all around to hear th th what they were saying in these languages that they were speaking in. And they were being told that God was good and God was gracious and God was mighty and, and God was generous and, and Jesus had risen from the dead and, and maybe death was defeated. I mean, they wanted to know if this was true. And what's interesting is that it happened to everyone who was in that room. It wasn't just the, the elite, the, the most devoted, the, the older, the, the spiritual leaders. And every single one of those people on the day of Pentecost, whether they were male or they were female, whether they were old or they were young, whether they had access to resources or were resource challenged, didn't matter. The Holy Spirit came and empowered each and every one of them. I wonder, how has God been faithful to you? In what way has he shown his generosity, his faithfulness, and his power? Well, I have a hard time talking to people about that. I know, and this is not a pep talk. I'm not here to tell you. You should just dig deep within yourself and make yourself do it. That's an inadequate resource. What I'm telling you is we need power to share the good news of Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes and he takes what we have heard and what we have seen and he makes it real to us and he empowers us to share it with someone else. If you find it difficult to casually and joyfully share God's goodness to you, you need power. And by the way, this is not about making, changing your personality. I would ask how many here are introverts, but you won't raise your hand. <laughs> so I won't. And some people think that God is going to turn you into some kind of human dynamo salesperson and that's not how it, it's not about changing your personality it's about finding your voice you have a voice that our world desperately needs to hear and the holy spirit can empower you to share that and then the holy spirit not only empowers us to share empowers us to care in acts chapter 2 continues this all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to sharing their meals including the lord's supper and to prayer a deep sense of awe came over them all and all the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Uh, I think if you've been around here very long, I've told you that I do have a superpower, and my superpower is the power of oblivion. What I can fail to notice is terrifying. Um, you know, um, uh, we were uh, sitting at home uh, uh, last night, and, uh, and, and Sue actually got up and, and took stuff out of the oven to get ready for our dinner, and I did not notice that. I was locked in on a project. And so I, I asked her, you know, is, is dinner anytime soon? And she says, did you not see me walk over? And I did not. Okay. I, uh, some of you, if, if you are in uh, uh, the grocery store or uh, someplace shopping and, and you see me, uh, I might not notice you. And, and it's not because I don't recognize your face. It's just my power of oblivion is superpower status. If I were to rip my shirt off this morning, there's an O right here uh, <laughs> for oblivion. 
But we all carry something of that oblivion. It's true. There are things, well, we have work, we have projects, we, we have, if you're in school, there's things that you're trying to learn, you're paying attention to the teacher or the professor, you're, you're, you're reading the, the required reading, uh, you, all these things, that, and we get locked into certain things and it's easy to miss other things. And those other things can be fairly important because there are people around us that are really going through a great deal of difficulty and sometimes it's not obvious because not just because we didn't notice, but because people hide this kind of thing fairly well. And, uh, and our world is actually skilled at not helping us to care more. It helps us how to be a little bit more ambivalent, a little bit more apathetic, if necessary, angry. So it's not my problem, it's not my concern, it's not my issue, not me, not now. Our world has kind of trained us for that. And of course, we cannot do everything for everyone, but we use that as our rationale for not doing anything for anyone. And the Holy Spirit has actually come to empower us to care. The new believers in Jerusalem, they had come from many nations of surrounding, and they were hearing the good news for the first time in their lives, but their resources were limited and they were depleted. They, they had only planned to be there for so long. And, they didn't know the teachings of Jesus. They didn't know the stories of the life of Jesus. They, 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 they were running out of resources and the church decided that they would subsidize their ability to stay there a little bit longer so that they could be grounded in the faith. And that meant that some of them gave, gave uh, resources out of their pocket. Some people even went, they had some property, they were willing to sell it so that other people could come to know Christ better. They shared because they cared. The Holy Spirit empowered them to be able to do that. Sharing the good news is one thing, sharing good food with somebody else is, is another thing. But what's true is that when we share as a group of people, we can actually do more than we can do on our own. For example, I don't know if you are aware of this, we have a ministry called Adoption Assistance. Let's just check, how many are aware we have this ministry? Yeah, that's quite a few of you that don't know this. Uh, the cost for adoption in our state is, in all states, honestly, has become unbelievably expensive. Fifty to seventy thousand dollars would be the average cost right now. And so there was a couple that came to me, and they had an amazing idea. And their idea was, is what if we created a fund to help people underwrite the cost of their adoption? And we did that. And so we have been able to help so far one couple. And if you know any couples that are pursuing adoption, and if they are struggling with finding the financial resources necessary, we actually can give $10,000 grants. Not just one, several. How many think that's really cool? Yeah. Isn't that great? That's amazing. We're able to do more together than we can do on our own. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to care. The Holy Spirit also empowers us to dare. To dare. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's one thing to share the good news with people who like us and are like us. About the same age range, same economic status, pretty much like the same things, live in similar neighborhoods, similar relationship status. If you've got kids, it's easier to hang around with people with kids. If you don't have kids, you don't ever want to hang around people with kids. <laughs> and all of their, the, the, these disciples, their friends and their families are fr from that region, from that area. That's where they live. That's where they work. And, and of course, we want to share our faith with people who are closest to us and who, who love us and we love them and they're like us and we're like them. But, but the challenge comes when Jesus sends us out, out of our comfort zone. And uh, like Judea, that's, that's getting a little bit risky. Samaria feels very risky because they were a very different people, both in terms of how they practice their religion, but also in terms of ethnicity. And then to the ends of the world, 
And it's very easy to think like this. Well, you know, that's a lot of distance. Sometimes it's not about people who are distant from us. It's just people who are different from us. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to cross our comfort lines and cross cultural lines and dare to be in environments that we're not comfortable with. Don't give any clues right now, and please don't yell out who you're for, but a number of you are probably pretty well entrenched and decided who you will vote for in the next election. Can, can you imagine, can you imagine if, if Jesus asked you to share your faith with somebody from the other political party? Can you imagine that? Because if you can't, if you don't understand the kingdom yet. And if you can't, you haven't received power yet. The good news is not just for people who like us and are like us. The good news is for everyone, everywhere. <laughs> everyone, everywhere. How many are glad God doesn't leave anybody out? He wants everybody included, everybody. So that helps to make us a little bit more patient and a little bit more forgiving. And uh, the thing is, is that in order to, to share and to care and to dare, it's not about quoting from a script. It's more like telling our story because you have one. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. You have a story. A story of how you met Christ, a story of how you came to know that Christ was real, a story that, that God that showed his faithfulness to you in some way. And you've probably tried to share that story with mixed reviews because some people just assume the only reason you would share good news with them is that you're trying to control some aspect of their life. The Holy Spirit has not come into our life to empower us to control others or their decisions. He's just come to empower us to share the good news, to care about the people that are going out around us, and to dare to step in environments that we might not be the most comfortable in. That's what he's come to do. The, the disciples found out that not everyone appreciated that good news, and in fact, some of them were arrested, and they were beaten, and they were threatened, and. And, and they were told, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And, and so those recently bruised, beaten, and attempted to intimidate disciples went back with the rest of the disciples, and they were gathered for prayer. And as they were praying, this is the kind of prayer that they began to pray. Father, observe their threats. Observe the things that they're doing against us. And what do we want? They don't ask God to strike them down. They don't ask God to force their knees to bow. They, this is what they ask God for. Do even more healings around us. Give us even more good news to share. Help us speak boldly. That, that word bold doesn't just mean loud, and it doesn't just mean harsh. In the Greek language, it means that it's unreserved speech, that there's a joyful, confident way that you say things. That's not something you work up. That's not something that's a, an aspect of your personality. I, my wife and I went to a restaurant to celebrate our anniversary this last week, and, and uh, when we were there, there was a, a young man who came up. He was our, our, our wait staff for the evening, and this is what he told us. He said, hello, my name is, and he said his name, and he said, this is my very first night on my own, so please forgive me for all the mistakes I'm going to make. <laughs> but he said it so confidently that I wondered if this was his shtick. Maybe. Our problem is that we feel powerful when we're angry, and we feel powerful when we rant. But God can't use that in our world. He wants bold speech, not angry speech. And here's the thing that, that surprises us. This empowering of the Holy Spirit is a gift, just like our salvation. We don't earn it. We don't acquire it on our own efforts. We can't obtain it by our merit. 
I, I know you've probably been told by somebody at some point in your life, if you just read more scripture or prayed more prayers or spent more time in rooms like this, that the Holy Spirit would empower you. But that's you working for it. That, Salvation is a free gift from God, and the Holy Spirit's empowering in our lives is a free gift from God, and how many are glad that you right now, where you are, as you are, the Holy Spirit can empower you to share, to care, and to dare for the kingdom purpose. That's the message of the kingdom today. So would you bow your heads? Uh, Father, um, there's so many who don't know. There are so many who carry the weight of their world on their shoulders, and they don't know that you have come to redeem and to restore them. They don't know the price you paid for them. They don't know how much you love them. They don't know. And our just declaring a theological position or doctrinal position is not going to change their lives. But if we could be joyful sharers of our own experience, would you empower us for that? That the world may know. You are loving God and you have sent your son and he has given his life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.